but yeah, so this is a uh, toroidal Maxwell criminal correspondences. Um, I'm going to start, I think, just for the people who um, haven't seen uh, planar Maxwell criminal correspondences before uh, with the planar setting. And then I'll talk about what it means to move to the toroidal setting. Um, so uh, uh, we're going to start with uh, a, a planar graph, a uh, straight line plane graph, you know, fam familiar setting anyway, uh, with these stresses um, on all of the edges. Um, you know, with this standard interpretation of pulling vertices inwards or pushing them outwards. Um, and then declaring this graph to be in equilibrium with respect to uh, the set of edge weights, um, if it satisfies this, um, you know, linear constraint uh, based on the positions of the vertices and the um, edge weights. Um, and so one of the things that Maxwell did, um, building on prior work by various people, um, was he drew, um, oh, something's wrong with this thing. Uh, here we go. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, he, he drew the dual graph of this planar graph um, in such a way that um, at least optionally um, in, uh, but, you know, irrelevant in the way that he wrote these down, um, he wanted to draw the dual graph in such a way that um, every dual edge was drawn uh, perpendicularly or orthogonally to the corresponding primal edge. Um, uh, of course, the, the shifting the, of the dual graph doesn't really matter. Um, in such a way that the length of the dual edge um, corresponds to the length of the primal edge with respect to um, this weighting on the edge, the stress. Um, and he called this a reciprocal diagram. Um, in this picture here, the blue graph is the dual graph. Um, uh, and the vertex in the middle of the blue graph actually corresponds to the outer face of the primal graph that's in black. Um, and uh, but one of the things uh, that he did was he actually drew a lot of these reciprocal diagrams um, in his papers. Um, and what you can do is if you uh, walk around the faces of this dual graph, that certifies, uh, in fact, that the original primal graph is in equilibrium with respect to um, the edges around it. So basically, you take um, all of the edges around some vertex, and that turns into um, a set of edges around some face of the dual. And so uh, you have equilibrium around every vertex if and only if the corresponding face, well, the edges of, around that face actually close up into um, a closed polygon around that face. Um, this dual graph might not actually be an embedding. Um, it's just, uh, um, you know, if, depending on how you set your stresses, uh, but we'll get to embeddings later on. The other thing um, that, um, Maxwell proposed was this um, lifting of the, the graph into three dimensions in such a way that really the graph you can think of as the projection of this lifting back down to uh, the plane. Um, and the way you should think about this is that um, if the stress on that edge is positive, um, then the lifting is convex at that edge. Um, so for example, the, the faces fold up and otherwise it's concave. And so you can see then that this picture um, from uh, Cyprian and uh, Eliana's paper from a few years back, um, here's a lifting of a graph on the plane um, to a poly uh, polyhedral lifting in R3. Um, and you can see here all of the, um, uh, so sort of interpreting the diagram, all of the stresses on the interior edges are all negative. And that's why the lifting is concave around every single edge. Um, and uh, that's sort of what Maxwell uh, you know, did back in 1864. Um, basically what he said was, um, if you have an equilibrium stress, you get this reciprocal diagram and you get this polyhedral lifting. Um, I have this if and only if here, the attribution says Maxwell, but really um, I believe Walter Whiteley was the one who actually proved the, uh, the converse, the direction where if we have these liftings um, and reciprocal diagrams, we actually get the equilibrium stress back. Um, so I'm missing the attribution there, sorry. Um, but what happens uh, if you specifically uh, restrict yourself to positive equilibrium um, is that uh, you get a convex polyhedral lifting um, and the reciprocal diagram is actually embedded. Um, and then if you take these pictures over here with the positive equilibrium stresses and the convex polyhedral lifting and the embedded dual graph and you go to a computational geometer and you show them these pictures, um, 
they're probably going to react with uh, two words or two names, basically. Um, the first one corresponds to these positive equilibrium stresses, um, and that's touch spring embedding from 1963. Um, you have the same linear system, it's just that you uh, require that um, all these stresses are positive. And then um, given that an abstract graph and these sets of weights, you can actually solve for vertex coordinates for every uh, interior vertex after fixing the position of your um, the outer face. Um, you can find positions uh, for the interior vertices so that um, every vertex is in equilibrium with respect to um, these stresses on all of its uh, incident edges. And so here are some pictures of the same graph um, that's been embedded with that spring embedding via different um, positive stresses. Um, and if you show these two pictures to any computational geometer, the first words that come out of their mouth is probably going to be um, Delaunay and Voronoi, Delaunay triangulations and Voronoi diagrams. What's actually happening here is um, it's a weighted Delaunay and Voronoi uh, diagram for those of you who are familiar with um, you know, standard non-weighted Delaunay and Voronoi things. But there's this stuff that you can do um, that basically takes every uh, Delaunay triangulation or weighted Delaunay triangulation and you can define um, a uh, convex polyhedron in R3, uh, such that the Delaunay triangulation is the projection of this um, convex polyhedron. And then the, the corresponding dual Voronoi diagram is the projection of some uh, projective dual of this convex polyhedron. Um, and so it turns out that if you take this additional perspective from Delaunay triangulations and Voronoi diagrams, um, that Maxwell's uh, reciprocal diagrams are exactly uh, the corresponding weighted Voronoi diagram to your original graph for some appropriate setting of weights on the vertices. Um, now, um, I haven't actually described what the details of this translation are, uh, but this is something that's um, at least somewhat fairly well understood. Um, and you can actually translate between um, the, the Delaunay weights on the vertices and the uh, equilibrium, the positive equilibrium stress values on the edges um, fairly easily. Um, I think the details are um, all out there somewhere. Um, I think Ileana and, and uh, Supriyan's paper has some of these details and I, um, and this and the paper that I wrote with Jeff actually um, cribbed off a lot of those derivations. So thank you. Um, are they here? I don't know if they're here. Uh, hmm. No, it appears not. Oh, well. Um, and so if you put all of this together, at least if you're um, considering strictly positive equilibrium stresses, um, then you have, in addition to uh, the Maxwell, correspond Maxwell chromonal correspondence that was proven by Maxwell and um, I guess uh, Henry and Walter, um, and you put this together with this Delaunay triangulation stuff, then you get this four-way correspondence between four different things on the plane. And so um, then you can say, well, what happens to, um, different pieces of this if we move beyond the plane. And there's been a lot of work about doing these things in 3D. In fact, Maxwell did a lot of this stuff in 3D. Um, and even higher dimensions, there's some work about doing this um, on the hyperbolic plane, hyperbolic disks. Um, but uh, today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, basically uh, flat tori, um, which are not tori that look like the donut. Um, specifically, um, I'm going to talk about uh, flat tori where I'm going to take this donut and I'm going to smush it flat. Um, and then um, I'm going to um, in, talk about various geometries of flat tori. Eliana has a class. Oh, that's unfortunate. But she's familiar with this work, so I think that's OK. Unfortunate that she can't give us her perspectives on this. Um, and, and so the way that I'm going to think about a flat torus is like if I'm playing a game of asteroids or a game of Pac-Man where um, I'm just on some kind of parallelogram. And if I move off the right edge, I'm going to move back in on the left edge. And if I move off the, the top edge, I'm going to move back in on the bottom edge. Um, but some of you might prefer to not think about flat tori in that way. Some of you might prefer to think of this um, via translations of uh, this uh, rectangle or the parallelogram onto the plane, the so-called universal cover, um, where if you move off of one copy, you uh, come in on the other copy, um, but then there's a corresponding copy on the other side um, that does the same thing. And specifically, I'm going to uh, allow you to change the geometry of 
um, this parallelogram. And in doing so, you also change sort of the geometry that you inherit from the plane. Um, so for example, uh, if you take a circle in this parallelogram over here induced by you know, the planar metric, uh, and you pull it back to um, this picture over here, what you end up getting is not so much a circle in the plane, um, but rather an ellipse, uh, if you look at it via this metric. Um, and so uh, the geometry, the specific geometry of the flat torus will be um, an important part of this uh, later on. Um, when we move from planar graphs to uh, flat torus graphs, um, one of the things is uh, we can't just talk about um, straight line segments anymore. Uh, because, um, well, between two vertices, you might have multiple uh, parallel geodesics that don't coincide. Uh, so for example, here you can see um, that uh, uh, you might have edges that wrap off one, set, um, one edge of this parallelogram and comes back in um, on the other side. And uh, this would be considered different from an edge that wraps around the torus in some other way. And so abstractly, uh, these are parallel edges in the graph. And on the plane, if you insist on drawing all edges as straight line segments, these would get combined because um, they just overlap and you, you consider them actually the same edge. But on a torus or this infinite periodic tiling on the plane, um, you, uh, you have to be a bit more careful about this. Um, so I guess on the plane, you think of this as um, different copies um, of the vertices um, have different straight line segments between them, uh, but you really have to make sure that you're remembering that they're different copies of the same vertex. Okay. Um, but you know, if you prefer thinking about, that, about it that way, instead of on the flat torus, you are fully free to. Um, just the pictures that I show you might not always coincide with that um, you know, infinite lifting picture, um, you know, specifically this one, uh, if you prefer to think about this on the plane. Um, and so what happens is we had this, um, you know, a full equi four-way equivalence uh, on the plane. And uh, some of these equivalences are still present if we move to flat tori. Um, but what happens is uh, specifically we lose um, sort of the, the Maxwell side of things where uh, if we start with positive equilibrium, um, you know, getting these reciprocal diagrams. Um, and and the, the question of what exactly do we lose depends on a few different things. Um, now, uh, let me talk about, first of all, this positive equilibrium stuff. Uh, the positive equilibrium stuff, uh, that generalizes fairly well um, because equilibrium around every vertex is a purely local condition. And as a result, we can define equilibrium around a vertex on a flat torus, um, just like you do in the plane, as long as you take into account the fact um, that you have this wraparound. And so um, one way to think about this is to use um, in the notation here, this bracket u dash v, uh, u to v, um, that tells you that this edge wraps around the torus in a certain way. And so you have to be sure that um, you're calculating this correctly. Or you can move to the universal cover and you can use um, coordinates in the universal cover, just pick an arbitrary copy of this vertex um, and then pick the correct copies of its incident neighbors um, in the universal cover and work with coordinates around there, and you can still define equilibrium just fine. Um, and then because um, this is a um, linear constraint where the right-hand side is zero, zero, um, it actually, you can, you, you can look at this and say, well, it actually doesn't depend on the geometry of um, my flat torus at all, uh, because changing the shape of my flat torus is, apply, uh, is equivalent to applying a linear transformation and, um, well, summing up to zero, zero doesn't depend on that at all. Um, and so equilibrium is fairly robust with respect to the geometry of this flat torus, no matter what you're doing. Um, and then the touch spring embeddings that I was talking about before, um, you can do this just fine. Um, uh, the hard part is proving that when you solve this equilibrium system, you actually get uh, an embedding of your graph, um, but that's been proven um, quite a few times now, actually, over the last few decades. Um, the original paper, Yves Colin de Verdier's paper, actually um, proves that you can do this on any uh, surface of non-positive curvature. Um, and so in particular, you can go beyond tori. Uh, it's just that when you move beyond tori, you no longer have a nice linear system. You have to solve this um, uh, energy functional, but uh, it still generalizes just fine. Uh, to higher of surfaces as long as you insist on non-positive curvature everywhere. Um, 
And then you can, on the other side of that dividing line that I was talking about before, you can ask about, well, what about this um, notion of Delaunay triangulations and Voronoi diagrams that I was talking about before? Well, it turns out that Delaunay triangulations are also a purely local construct uh, because there's this characterization of being weighted Delaunay uh, that involves basically you take um, a, a triple of vertices and you draw a circle around that. And you say, if that circle doesn't contain any other vertices, then this, then I'm going to put a triangle down between those three vertices. Um, and you can generalize this to notions of weighted circles and um, this weighted circle weighted not containing any other vertex. Um, but the, uh, but regardless of you know what those actual definitions are, uh, the moral of the story is you can take this local view of Delaunay triangulations and completely generalize it to the flat torus setting, um, just by again making sure that you're wrapping your circles around in the right way. Um, and you can also take your reciprocal diagrams at least specifically um, uh, if you take Maxwell's later work and you insist on the uh, dual graph being drawn orthogonally, um, you can well do the same thing, um, except here uh, the notion of ortho drawn orthogonally um, that really means that I have to fix um, a metric on the torus. I have to fix a geometry of the torus in order to actually understand what being drawn in orthogonally means. And so I have to insist that we have to fix, unlike in the equilibrium case, I have to fix um, the geometry of the torus before talking about these orthogonally embedded duals. Um, and then once you do this, you can actually find um, that the, just like in the planar setting, these reciprocal diagrams are actually co the corresponding weighted Voronoi diagrams to your original graph uh, with respect to the appropriate set of vertex weights. Um, and actually, uh, uh, because the corresponding Voronoi diagram to every Delaunay triangulation is an orthogonal embedding of the dual, um, you have this if and only if uh, recovered uh, for flat torus graphs almost immediately just from staring at the definitions of these things. Um, what breaks now is um, if you have a reciprocal diagram, you, uh, sorry, what breaks um, in the diagram was uh, if you have an equilibrium uh, stress, uh, getting an equ a reciprocal diagram out of that. The converse is still true. The part where if you have a reciprocal diagram getting um, an equilibrium stress, this part still works just fine um, because you can just basically write down what the stresses of each edge is uh, based on the lengths of the dual and the primal edges in the, uh, in the original drawing and the orthogonal reciprocal diagram. Um, and then if you try to go from equilibrium to reciprocal, now you break because um, what happens is, and I think the, it's, this is clear to see in the, universal, um, in the universal cover, if you go to the plane and you assign a, a, a stress to every edge and you try to do what Maxwell did, to get a and basically an infinite tiling of, of the dual graph. Um, what you get is that the periodicity of that dual graph is wrong. So if you stare at this um, infinite plane graph over here and you assign a stress of one half to every edge and you follow Maxwell's prescription of computing the dual graph and then you draw the dual graph in such a way that all of the edges are drawn orthogonally to their primal edges, um, you get this picture and hopefully you can see uh, the periodicity. The periodicity of this thing is drawn um, in these blue dashed lines. And that is very much not the square that we started on, okay? Um, and so what we find is that um, specifically reciprocality is not shape agnostic, even though um, equilibrium was. And on some level, this is not a super surprising concept um, in hindsight, in so far as um, when you're talking about reciprocality, at least um, you know, in the way that I've been talking about it, where I insist that my dual graph is drawn um, orthogonally, well, orthogonality depends on the metric, right? It's a conformal property um, of basically my metric, right? I have to I have to set down a metric first and then say um, I want to draw this orthogonally, and it's not so, perhaps so surprising um, that if you pick the wrong metric, then uh, orthogonality um, plays weirdly with this. Right, And so what happens is we actually can write down a full characterization of when we have the right metric um, with respect to this equilibrium stress. And so for example, one of the calculations that we can do is if you want to have an orthogonally embedded dual on the units on the same, 
flat torus if you're starting with the unit square, um, you can compute these um, three parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, and say, well, as long as alpha, beta, and gamma are equal to one, one, zero, then the reciprocal diagram, the orthogonal reciprocal diagram actually embeds back onto the same unit square flat torus. At which point you might stare at these and say, what the hell is going on with alpha, beta, and gamma? Um, well, here's the geometric interpretation of, of what these mean. Um, so you can uh, translate from alpha, beta, and gamma to the tet energy, which is alpha plus beta. Uh, and you can think of this as a tet energy of the, this diagram. And it's the scaling um, for the dual. So basically, um, if you um, multiply all of your stresses by the same constant multiplicative factor, uh, that's the same as scaling your dual graph um, or the, uh, the lengths of all the edges in your dual graph by that constant factor. And so you need to make sure if you're going to try to embed your dual graph on the same um, sort of scaling of the geometry of the flat torus, you need to make sure that this tut energy is correct. Um, and then alpha minus beta is sort of orth um, orthogonal and isotropic and anisotropy. Um, depending on how the parameters work out, maybe uh, the graph is sheer, uh, is stretched too far uh, horizontally or stretched too far vertically, and you need to make sure that that's correct. Um, and then this cross term gamma uh, refers to shearing. So have I sheared the shape of this thing um, in a certain way? Um, and so basically, if I want to start with the unit square flat torus and then end up back on the unit square flat torus, I need to make sure, first of all, that the scaling is all correct. I need to make sure that I'm not pulling horizontally or vertically in some way. And I also need to make sure that I'm not shearing. And so that's exactly why I have alpha beta gamma equals 110. Um, and the proof of this is basically you stare at the topology or the topological aspects of taking this graph and embedding it on the torus and then working with um, the homological aspects of these things um, and various circulations. And then it all just falls out as soon as you analyze the topology of the torus. Um, but then you can ask yourself, well, what if I don't want to start on the torus? What if I want to start on some other geometry and I want to end on that same geometry that I started with that's not um, the unit square. Well, um, it turns out that you still have, first of all, you have to fix um, the scaling correctly. Um, and the way you do that is you ensure that alpha beta minus gamma squared is equal to one. Um, and then once you have that scaling correct, uh, what happens is you can uh, find basically an infinite family of matrices that describe uh, shapes of the flat torus on which this um, graph will have an orthogonal reciprocal embedding on the same flat torus. Um, and so for example, you can even start with the unit square um, and then plop down um, a set of um, edge stresses. And then once you normalize, you can figure out, okay, um, with respect to these edge stresses, really all of the geometries on which um, I get an orthogonal embedding of the dual are all uh, described by matrices that are similar to this thing that I calculated. Okay. And so um, in conclusion, what happens there is that we can sort of recover uh, some partial version of uh, the planar Maxwell Cremona Delaunay correspondence. And specifically what happens there is um, if you start with a graph in equilibrium, you can find some geometry, you know, you change, you fix the geometry uh, so that you can actually get an orthogonally embedded um, dual on the same flat torus. Um, some versions of this were previously known um, from some variations of circle packing theorems, um, but that those results basically prove that there is some um, geometry of the flat torus where you get it correct. Here we actually characterize um, all uh, geometries where you get a proper Delaunay embedding and with the corresponding uh, reciprocal orthogonally um, embedded dual. Um, now I've been saying orthogonally a lot and the reason that I kept insisting on using the orthogonal interpretation of these Maxwell Cremona uh, you know, reciprocal diagrams uh, was because I wanted to be able to make this connection to computational geometry uh, where specifically the Delaunay triangulations and their corresponding Voronoi diagrams are in fact um, orthogonal duals of each other. Um, but if you go back to all the way be the, to the beginning uh, with Maxwell, um, and I drew them this um, uh, reciprocal diagram, um, I said that orthogonality was uh, optional. 
And in fact, um, if you think about this on the plane, it really doesn't matter how you draw your duel because you can just rotate it um, by any angle. And it's still, um, if it was an, an embedding of the duel before, it is still an embedding now. Um, and the, really the only thing that really matters as far as the Maxwell Cromona correspondence is concerned uh, is this uh, condition over here on the lengths of all the edge, uh, the dual edges being, you know, having the correct length with respect to uh, the edge stress and the length of the primal edge. And so in fact, um, even though I showed here pictures, um, uh, actually, I think, uh, let me remember. In fact, the picture that I showed here from Maxwell's paper, um, if you look at figure three in, um, in Arabic numerals versus figure three in Roman numerals, these two, are, or, um, these two pictures are reciprocal diagrams of each other um, where all of the edges are actually drawn in parallel. And this is a very useful interpretation um, if you are a physicist and you're interpreting these things actually as force diagrams um, and you're interpreting the reciprocal diagram as um, a drawing that represents the fact that all the forces, if you line up the forces next to, um, around this vertex next to each other, that they form a closed polygon. Um, and so um, in a lot of Maxwell's pictures, um, in addition to drawing the dual orthogonally, he also drew a lot of them in parallel. And so then if you ignore this um, sort of computational geometry motivation of keeping the dual orthogonal, um, we can ask, well, what happens if we draw this in a different way? And sort of the, the short answer is, well, it depends on the geometry of your torus, once again. And partially that's because, um, uh, again, uh, the angle at which you draw the reciprocal diagram, that has an inherent notion of the metric of your flat torus in it. And so, for example, if I required orthogonality, I had this, um, you know, this characterization that I described that um, you get an orthogonal dual embedding if and only if the matrix uh, describing the shape of your torus is similar to this formula over here. Um, but if we insist on the dual being embedded in parallel, for example, um, the shape actually turns out to not matter because um, uh, your dual being drawn in parallel to the primal edges actually doesn't depend on the metric at all. Um, parallel is a more inherent notion um, than the specific metric, whereas um, your notion of orthogonality does depend on your metric. Um, and then you can take this idea sort of forward and say, well, suppose I fix some angle theta and I ask you to um, uh, tell me you know, what happens if I insist on um, my dual graph being embedded um, so that every dual edge ha has angle theta with respect to its primal edge. And you can sort of write down, you know, sort of um, as generalizing this orthogonal and parallel stuff, you can write down the full characterization of what happens um, in that setting as well. And then there is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned before uh, that, you know, that, that, you know, work has been done about um, generalizing the Maxwell Cremona correspondence from the plane um, to other spaces like three or four higher dimensions. Um, and uh, you know, there's this work on moving to other metrics like this paper that came out, I think in the last decade or so about doing this on the hyper in hyperbolic spaces. Um, and so there's this question of what about other surfaces, right? I've talked about doing this on flat tori, um, but there's this prior work that says that um, you know these things that I defined very locally, the um, you know these uh, equilibrium drawings, uh, like this tut spring embedding um, and Delaunay triangulations. These things um, were defined locally, and you can generalize these to higher genus surfaces um, by interpreting them as simplicial complexes. And actually, I believe there's a good amount of work that uh, about doing this, um, not just for surfaces, but also in three manifolds, uh, because you can define three-dimensional Delaunay uh, tetrahedralizations as well. Um, but then uh, this line that I drew before between these spring embeddings and these Delaunay triangulations, um, there's a big open question about what happens there. Um, and then uh, beyond that, if you move uh, specifically from this uh, other picture that I was uh, that I didn't draw about orthogonally embedded duels versus parallelly embedded duels, um, it's not quite clear what's going to happen there when we move beyond flat tori, because there we have this nice notion of um, you know uh, global 
notion of orthogonality or global notion of the angles between the primal and the dual edge. The problem is when you move over to hydrogenous surfaces, um, what metric are you going to use? Um, and if you're going to move to, for example, um, uh, the hyperbolic setting, if you want a uniform hyperbolic metric on your surface, um, what is the right notion of, you know, uh, all of these things? And all of these are open questions um, that, uh, you know, I would love to know the answer to. And I don't really don't know enough about hyperbolic geometry to answer um, if I want to talk about this in hydrogenous surfaces. Um, the other question for this is, um, what is all of this useful for and how can we use any of this stuff? Um, on the one hand, at least if you uh, take this over to the computational geometers, um, there is this answer of, well, Delaunay triangulations and Voronoi diagrams are clearly useful in computational geometry. And so it must be useful to have a characterization of when a flat torus graph is a Delaunay triangulation of its point set. Um, but we don't know when it's actually used. Uh, if we move more abstractly to Maxwell toroidal Maxwell chromatic correspondences, ignoring the computational geometry um, sort of pseudo uh, application, I really don't know how to use any of this stuff in anything else, right? Um, a lot of this Maxwell chromatic correspondence stuff on the plane and in uh, Euclidean three space, these were all motivated, um, as Walter was. Um, hinting at before to real world things like architecture and um, building things. I don't know what um, a flat torus um, you know, equilibrium graph is useful for. Uh, you can, of course, um, imagine that if you think about this as a purely periodic thing, uh, there are uses in, for example, um, you know, uh, periodic uh, crystal structures, um, you know, uh, Ileana and Cyprian have this paper about uh, periodic liftings um, in, uh, from a periodic planar graph into R3. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work that's out there about periodic structures um, in three space. Um, but I'm not sure what uh, the application of this toidal um, uh, picture is beyond saying, well, the flat torus is the same thing as an infinite periodic plane uh, thing. And beyond that, I really don't know what to do if I insist on changing the metric beyond flatness in the torus. And I don't know what to do in hydrogenous surfaces where really sort of um, the easy thing to do is to assume a uniform hyperbolic metric. Um, but if you're not gonna assume a uniform hyperbolic metric, I'm even more lost about what to do. Okay. Um, and I do not have a good handle on time because the last time I gave this talk, it was uh, I had much less than an hour for this. And so I'm actually really under time. So maybe at this point, maybe we should, uh, I don't know, move over to uh, a more of a back and forth format where we can talk about more aspects of this stuff. I'm actually really happy to have Walter Whiteley here so we, he can offer his um, perspectives on you know, sort of the more classic Maxwell Cremona stuff and not the toroidal stuff. So I'm sure Walter has comments and I think he has put some of them already in the chat, but maybe. Right. Yeah, so there is comment he has about um, what ha what the reciprocal diagram means in higher, in higher dimensional surfaces and, um, and why we care about orthogonality specifically in higher dimensions, yeah. Okay, I was making a record, a few things. One thing is that there is a projective version of reciprocal diagram. Mm -hmm. Namely, if you think of this as a polyhedron, try to draw the cross section. And that's a projective construction and it's an if and only if for planar graphs. Yeah, you're talking about this picture here? Uh, no, sort of. I'm talking yeah. about a different where you show me the picture and instead of drawing, I, I actually try to draw a in the plane, a, a cross section of that polyhedron. Ah. I align for every face, to fit the, the line for two faces meets in a point that's on the edge you're actually staring at in the original picture. If you can complete that cross section, then it is indeed, uh, a, uh, got, got a self-stress and I can tell you what the stress is and whatever. So 
a completely projective construction can be done and close up. And you can think about cross sections for um, if you imagined it was a picture of a th three dimensional torus. Uh -huh. And there you actually, you, you, in addition to doing the cross section of the existing faces, what you want to do is two cross sections, one, one of each, one, each one sort of slicing through a, as, as a cycle that wouldn't cut, wouldn't separate the torus, but would be one of the two generating cycles of the, ter, of the topology of the torus. So I, I have some notes and whatever, and I think there's a way with a cross section to tell whether the picture you've got, in fact, is the projection, exact projection of a three-dimensional torus. And that by okay. itself is an interesting question. I see. You know, what are, what are the correct projections of, of a torus? There's a, a couple of e extra equilibrium conditions uh, about these generating cycles for the topology. Um, well, what you have is, is very nice and I just, I'll need to sort of see if I can drag out enough notes of, there was a, a paper we almost submitted to, <laughs> to be published, but didn't. But Gita already said, I've got this filing cabinet of <laughs> not quite published stuff. But, so let me pull out what I can and we can correspond some more. Okay. I'd, I'd be happy to. But the question of is the, is what you're looking at the projection of a closed torus in three space? That's a, that's, a, that's a real question because there actually is no theorem about which sets of faces can form a closed torus in three space. Right. That's, that's a realizability question that's not, as far as I know, still not solved. Right, yeah. So uh, when we were doing this uh, for the, uh, at least for the Delaunay triangulation stuff, we worked with the, we, we moved to over to the universal cover actually, and we, we leveraged a lot of stuff from the plane. Yeah, and yeah we do, we were wondering um, the whole time if, you know, maybe if there was the, a correct way of viewing this is not so much going from projecting down from R3, right, twice, you know, first down to the plane and then wrapping it back around, but rather just going directly from a periodic um, three-dimensional space. So I would like very much like to see that. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll see what I what I can find and share. I had to clear up my office, and some stuff didn't survive the uh, move. <laughs> yeah. So one thing I wanted to mention is that um, the way a combinatorist sees this is the fact that planar graphs are special in that the. Uh, the faces generate the cycle space, right? Right. which is not true anymore for the torus because you're one short, right? right? So the facial cycles do not generate the cycle space anymore. That's and right. So I think that matroids are not the perfect thing to deal with uh, graphs embedded on surfaces of higher genus, but it's right. the delta matroids. So Boucher introduced delta matroids in the 70s. And together with the Tut theory about maps, these are the perfect tool for looking um, combinatorially at graphs embedded on surfaces. And here you have uh, an upper matroid, which is the, the one with um, a large rank and mm -hmm. the, the lower matroid, which is the one with the lower rank. And in the planar case, the upper matroid and the lower matroid are completely identical, that identifies planar graphs. And so for the torus, you get an upper matroid and the lower matroid, and they're two apart, right? You can actually tell from the, um, the these um, independent sets in this delta matroid, if the map was um, orientable or non-orientable. And you have this nice duality theory Right, so you just the, the upper matroid goes into the lower matroid in the dual, and uh, you have all the um, elements in between. So it's it's also on the edge sets of the the graph. 
And I think it's a very nice theory that I don't know how it translates into the geometry of actually attaching length or doing something with geodesics on, on a surface, but the combinatorial theory is really the delta matroid. Right. Can I say there is a, a reasonable theory of reciprocal diagrams on the sphere? And that is relevant if on the sphere, you're looking at a polyhedron and you put the normals onto the sphere and then put the perpendiculars to the edges. You're at, the stresses there actually nicely describe the Minkowski decomposition of the original polyhedron and, and things like that. So there's a reasonable th theory on the sphere uh, that implicitly is, is reg I regularly think about and I'll try to put some of that into one of the papers I'm writing now, but it's at least worth noticing what's going on on the sphere. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with the Rankine reciprocals? Not as much as I should be. Just for people yeah. to think about it. The one way to think about the perpendicular, well, even in the plane, think, of, think, think about your original planar graph, put down a, a circle at every vertex, and then it grow those circles until they meet at a line, uh, which will then be perpendicular to the edges. This is a soap bubble kind of picture. And that's a way of creating a version of the reciprocal. And Rankin did that in 3D, expanded a, a bubble around every vertex, looked to see how the two bubbles at the end of an edge met in a plane perpendicular to the edge. And you can, in your imagination, you can think of that as a, being a projection of a four polytope. Right. What's not true in, in that dimension though is just because you've got a self-stress doesn't mean you've got a reciprocal. Right. But if you've got a reciprocal, you again have liftings and there are some theorems about liftings of these kind of uh, polytopes in all dimensions. Um, the, the person who wor worked on it has sort of stopped working on those kind of things. So I, I'm just trying to, I'm not even coming up with his name immediately, but uh, so there is some theory and it depends on the homology of whatever it is you're working on in dimension D. Mm -hmm. But there is some theory, it doesn't always relate to statics. Right. One, one of the remarkable these theorems is if in, if in three space, for example, I draw the vertices, edges, and faces of a simple polytope in four space. And if I manage to get the face, get it drawn with all the uh, so-called two faces actually flat, it's guaranteed to have a reciprocal and to be a projection. It's sort of because of what's going on at the vertices is so simple that all the, ge all the hard geometry went into drawing the faces flat and nothing else has to be <laughs> even looked at. And so I have a, a short paper on that that's around as well if you're curious about higher dimensions. The, um, the, the circle interpretation of um, the Rankine reciprocals also is, um, I think, one of the uh, nicer ways for people to interpret Voronoi diagrams. Yeah. So it's a nice way to see that these two are the same, on the plane at least. Yeah. Yeah. But Rankin published his 3D thing essentially around the same time as Maxwell. Yeah, I have all, I have the, the correct references somewhere or another, um, I think. Not so much in the presentation. Right. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I want to say Rankin. Rankin also. I think 
late 1850s, early 1860s. And I think Maxwell, a lot of Maxwell stuff was also around the same time. Exactly. Yeah. They published in the same journal sometimes in, in like 1864, 1863. Right. There is a Cremona reciprocal in 3D as well, or a planar graph, where you draw the edges parallel to the original edges and as the cycle closes up at each of the vertices with a completely different object in three space. And applies to completely different graphs. Can you explain this a little bit more about this Cremona in three space? Because I didn't get the idea. <clears throat> Take a planar graph embedded in three space with mm -hmm. a self stress. Okay, every... but, but it's not, it, it, the, the points are now spanning three space, so to speak, right? Yeah, but at a at each vertex, if you've got an equilibrium, then the forces should sum to zero as a polygon. Okay. And you just patch together those polygons. That's the one of the ways to get the reciprocal is patching together those uh, polygons, polygons of forces. And you close okay. it up. But it's quite different. And you're starting out with a planar graph in three space. Yeah, say a dependent version of the octahedron, which is yeah, what, that's I, right. that's what I was thinking of. Yes, all the flexible octahedra are necessarily got a self stress. Yes. In fact, the self stress is the instantaneous velocity as as it tries to move. <laughs> yes. Yes. So as you are patching about the polygons, the polygons could intersect in the interiors, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. But they, being a self stress, the two po polygons must have equal length edges as you patch them. Yeah. And then the question is does it close? Mm -hmm. So, does it close geometrically, right? Combinatorially, everything works <laughs> all the time, right? Right. Now you're doing it's it so geometry. stressful. I'm not sure Cremona ever looked at that kind of 3D thing, but uh, mm. yeah. And I don't remember, I know I've talked about this with other people and I don't know immediately of any ap immediate applications. So, and as you say polygons, you actually mean flat objects or mm. not? No. No, just polygons. <laughs> Just a closed path of edges. Yes, yes, yes. But the edges are at least straight, right? So it's not a combinatorial thing that geometry only comes in, I see in the thing. The edges no, are, the are points, really vectors. The points determine the displacement. Yeah. Yeah. So pa Patrick, is this likely to be leading towards some of your thesis or? Yeah, it's it's half of it, and my, most of my th my thesis is basically like tr was trying to do a bunch of computational geometry on flat tori, and and so in the middle of trying to do this, um, we stumbled upon oh right, um, yes, Maxwell Cremona on the plane is the same thing as, um, you know, the correspondence between weighted Delaunay and weighted triangle uh, and weighted Voronoi diagrams, mm -hmm. and so we were very interested in seeing well what happens on the flat tori. And then, and then in the middle of that, I also, you know, got caught up in. Oh wait, <laughs> there's a lot more here than just the geometry, than, than the computational geometry aspects. Mm 